um, to our first Kobokan after the New Year holiday. And uh, today we're very happy to have Yao Wen Yang, Yang Yao Wen, uh, who uh, is a NTU slash HRA alumni. So Yao Wen got his PhD at, in 2019 from UT Austin, where we overlapped for a few years there. And then after that, he uh, briefly uh, went to Japan at uh, Riken as a JSPS postdoc fellow. And then he returned back to the US uh, to University of Virginia as a, a origin postdoc fellow. And I think spring last year, uh, he moved to Japan again at Riken as a, a research scientist there in the Star, uh, Star and Planet Formation Group. And today, Yao Lun uh, will tell us uh, about his journey um, uh, using the most expensive telescope that people, uh, human ever made, JWST. Yeah. And mm -hmm. let's welcome Yao Lun. Thank you. Uh, this is my pleasure to be back here again. Um, I think if I just, I think I did a calculation. If I did, uh, take the building cost for the gems web divided by the amount of time I get, something like that, I think I got like a two million or something like that. Um, so, but Actually, we don't have to move it. Uh, but we have amazing data, so which I'm going to talk to you about today. So before I start, I want to just quick advertisement about Recon. I think this is a, an entity people sometimes hear about, but don't really know uh, what it is. So it is a, like a physical and chemical science institute in Japan. It's a federal research institute. It, we cover a few areas of um, uh, uh, astronomy, uh, so our lab doing star planet formation, we have other lab doing higher energy astrophysics and big band and early universe. And so for postdoc opportunities, we routinely have this uh, spatial postdoc research fellowship, uh, oftentimes the deadline is in April, so it's a little bit different life, uh, job cycle. Uh, we also have other programs for students, so if you want to learn more, I'm happy to do good. Um, okay, so I want to start the talk with uh, just a quick take home message I hope um, you take away from this talk today. Um, the one is that the chemical evolution um, is, uh, in my opinion, what really connects um, from the star forming stage to the planetary system. And this is something we really want to use this as a tool or use this as a perspective to connect what we have here in our solar system versus what we learn outside uh, for the star and planet that's forming right now. And then, then ice chemistry really holds the key to understand this connection and especially understanding the transformation process going from very simple species to a complex species. And, and JLST is playing a very pivotal role in, in Earth and all that, and, and the early results that we're seeing are, are actually very unexpected. So just kind of grounding us back home, as we know, there's recently there's a big snow in Kyoto, so a lot of water, a lot of ice um, in Kyoto, like to start a lot of things. Also, great, very great picture that this one I found. And and water is really something. Um, uh, it's interest. It's, it's a very simple molecule that we found on Earth, we found on our ocean. The vast majority of that, eight, oh, we also found in our so solar system, in comets, and also in and star forming regions. And this is actually a molecule that we can use to to track um, the com chemical evolution uh, all the way from. Uh, our planetary system to uh, the, the protoplanetary, uh, protosphere system. So what we found is that if we look at a present day solar, solar system, this is a deterioration fraction uh, in water, so basically HDO versus H2O. Um, in our solar system, we found that, uh, so the solar value for D2H and also for all of the gas and ice giants, they're pretty low. For the rocky planets, they're pretty high, uh, like significantly higher. And, and it seems that this, um, this is consistent with what we find in comet, which represents sort of like a pristine material left over from the formation processes that died to create our solar system. Okay, th but then the question is like, where this water or this high deteriorated water coming from? And there are ex extensive modeling studies, not just the one I mentioned here, but those other modeling studies suggest that um, the chemical evolution happening in the disk itself is not uh, sufficiently, um, uh, it's not efficient enough to create such high deteriorated uh, water. So that means this highly deteriorated water must coming from the early stage uh, into the uh, 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 protosphere core stage. So there, uh, just looking from the, for the deterioration ratio for water itself, we can already piece together this kind of chemical connection that 
some part of these water molecules have to inherit it so in some way, uh, all the way from uh, first or to the comet, and maybe comet will be uh, one of the major routes for water delivery to our, our Earth. So there's already this connection that we can we can make, and then, and but there's still a lot of question room, and but it's just demonstrating like how this chemical um, illusion or like chemical uh, marker can actually spread needles uh, to all the evolution uh, tracks of the uh, star and planet position. And so people have been compared um, um, chemical abundance in comets versus first are all the way like from about two decades, two de decades ago. Uh, so this is comparing a little bit more complex molecule including some of the single mo simple molecule in, in comet cobalt and um, and a few sources that we have data at the time. And you can see they kind of form this very nice linear uh, relation suggesting that the composition is somewhat similar. And at this point, we already see uh, a little bit more complex molecule pop up. So um, when I first saw this kind of thing, it reminded me my first like general chemistry that I did not really pay attention at all in college. But this is, this is something quite really interesting because it suggests that there's a lot of uh, these complex molecules that are rare, but they are also there uh, for to use it as a chemical track or tracker or like CAD uh, to see to compare chemical abundance between stages. Um, so now, with, with, then with Alma, we start to find um, a lot of these complex molecules in, in, in beta protostar, in class zero, class one protostar, and I think some of you know that IRS 16293, uh, 2422 is a very famous system that has a lot of. Uh, a rich molecule of this. So when we use Alma to observe this source, we get just like tons of line. You almost don't have any continuum. Determining continuum starts to become a really a daunting task because you're just completely flooded by the line. If we just zoom in these small regions in the spectrum, we start to see all kinds of molecules, all kinds of lines and can attribute to uh, various different complex organic molecules, or so-called comps. So this, this this source is really a poster child of what abundance complex molecules in, in, in the forest are will look like. So um, naturally, people start to think about, OK, we have this very well-studied source uh, of the uh, forest uh, And then recently, we also have a really well-studied comment. This is comment 67P, uh, surveyed by uh, the Rosetta mission. They actually fly a, a satellite there so they can take the mass spectrograph uh, to measure what's the molecule coming out from the, from the comment. And they found this really, really nice uh, correlation between the oxygen bearing molecules. And that just verify what we've seen before in two slides ago that there's a very nice correlation, like a very similar chemical abundance in, in at least in these two, two, two sources, and that we're doing a overgeneralization saying that they can represent the entire universe of, of uh, astrophysical objects. Uh, there are other uh, studies focused on a little bit more evolved source. This is a class one source, and compared to uh, including a different, more common, and you start to see that, that maybe there's still some linear linearity there, but they start to, start to see some uh, scatter. So suggesting that maybe some, something like something is not add up, or we don't we have not yet have enough uh, statistical uh, sample to tell the whole story. Um, so um, we, we have this molecule, we have this very complex molecule, those methanol, ethanol, uh, and all kinds of. Uh, like things we were learning in organic chemistry, how, where do these com mo complex molecules from? Um, so to um, to tell that, I have to go all the way back to uh, sort of pre-stereo phase. So this is a this is my pre-stereo core, and I'm zooming in, so you only see like part of that. The core center is over here. It's very really dark, meaning they're very really cold, and and because it's very really cold and dense, so we we'll start to have atoms or molecules frozen onto the dust grain. So initially you have a lot of the carbon, a lot of the oxygen frozen onto the, the dust grain, they get hydrogenized, hydrogenate, and so you have OH or carbon hydrogenation, we get CH4, and this OH will start to uh, react with other maybe uh, hydrogen or CO uh, to get water and CO2. So initially you have this very heavily dominated phase by uh, water and CO2 phase, and then, at some point, uh, CO start to um, become a dominant molecule in the gas phase, and they subsequently frozen down onto the dust grain. So you have this CO rapid formation phase, like kind of like covering around this this water and, and uh, CO two dominating uh, inner region. 
And then, so this is like a zooming view of like a like idealized uh, ice mantle. And, and this CO can further get hydrogenated, basically just adding hydrogen into the CO, um, you slowly build up to the point you have methanol. So um, some of the CO via subsequent hydrogenation, you start to have a lot of methanol. So that kind of setting the in initial stage of what's a typical um, or like ideal ice composition um, for the dust grain in a, in a cold uh, pre-stirred forest. Uh, but we know that star formation starts, you start forming a star in the center, heating starts coming in from the inside, and on the left here, that's our the initial dust grain that I told you before. And, and to form like even more uh, um, complex molecule, it, it gets a little bit tricky uh, when you have a lot of things frozen onto the dust grain because these um, um, this functional group or this radical like CH4, CH3, OH, um, um, I don't know, other other radicals, they, they cannot really move very freely on on a, a, on a uh, being frozen because they, they are frozen, so they cannot really move. It's very difficult for them to to tunnel because they are they are large. So there's very little reaction that can can occur. But then, as the temperature increases to like a little bit warmer temperature. Uh, we start to find out that in the modeling and also in the experiments, um, you can have some sort of a diffuse motion for these radicals for them to actually meet each other. And when they meet each other, they react really quickly because this, this is basically a reaction that can occur without any obstacles. And they can just meet each other, form larger molecules, but they're still frozen on, on, the, on the dust grain. So at this point, even if there are a lot of complex molecules already formed on the dust grain, we don't see it with all my, they are frozen, we don't see their gas emission lines. They don't have any rotation limit uh, spectral we can see. Um, only if when this, this ice cover, complex molecule ice cover dust grain, uh, move into these high, high temperature inner regions, when temperature is higher, these molecules get released in the gas phase, and that's where we see their rotational spectrum. So this is look like a very nice story, um, but then we start to find, detect like complex organic molecule in pre core where none of this heating has happened. They're, they're really cold, they remain really cold, but we start to see methanol, we start, yeah, methanol again in other source, and that's what I think there's recent study uh, in L1517B, uh, they also detect uh, a few kind of different complex molecules. And especially in the survey done by uh, Sekibili and Shirley, they surveyed a lot of different forest core, and they found 100% uh, of those core have methanol. And that's really surprising, considering like, well, we don't really think, um, that means like, you already can form pretty complex molecules in the beginning, and then, and the question is how. Um, so there's other pathways uh, reaction being proposed. I'm not going to into very detail on this, but I'm just gonna say that there are other, uh, perhaps you need to involve with the, the sort of like exchange between the gas and, 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 the, and the dust grain, maybe mm -hmm. things got, breaking down, putting the gas phase, and then kind of re, re depleted or refrozen onto the dust again. Or there's other uh, pathway we haven't really considered in the dust and ice that we can that can occur um, that can actually help on forming these complex molecules uh, in ice mantle. So one one particular kind of model I want to mention is this is so-called excited free body reaction. This is a a, a recent um, mechanism that I proposed like sort of demonstrating in, in Gina Gary in 2020. Uh, what they found is that okay, um, we have some sometimes you have like different radicals kind of right, right next to each other, but oftentimes some some um, reaction will have barrier. They just, even if they are sitting right next to each other, they don't react. They just stay there, remain their own entity. But then you can have this hydrogen go in and form is CH3, and they can give us some excessive energy that can help the entire compound kind of break, can overcome the barrier and kind of trigger that reaction that is, that is not happening. So you can have the hydrogen going, and just that everyone is just forming new molecules. And they kind of in, include this mechanism in their modeling, and it shows that, for example, this is acetaldehyde, like from the black dash line, which is the control symbol, to this um, I think it's a green one, and this is like the three body included one. 
and they can see orders of magnitude increase uh, in complex molecule formation on ice. So they found out this is very effective way that you can form a quite a few complex molecules in, in the ice mantle um, already without any heating. So basically the takeaway message here is that from a modeling perspective, it seems pretty straightforward and, and um, kind of easy to form complex molecules uh, in a model. And you don't really need a temperature. So where do these complex molecules go? They, what happens is they, they have, you have ice cover complex molecules in an envelope. Um, one thing we really want to connect to is to connect to the disk. So, but I mean, detecting complex molecules in the disk is very rare, and I think there's maybe just maybe a handful of detection for mass volumes of cyanide, and that's pretty much it. And and this one particular disk is quite interesting. This is HD one double five four seven F five four six. Um, they, they have a detection. They found detection for methanol, um, kind of very compact methanol for the center. And but the interesting part of this this source is that it is a Herbert disk, so it is really warm. So, which means that at those temperature, uh, methanol cannot be like met the the grand surface route, like the, the one I talked about before, like you have hydrogenation of CO, like just adding things on the on the ice uh, icy dust is is not working because it's too warm. Like you don't have the molecule lock on the on the dust grain, so. So you cannot form methanol in situ. You cannot form methanol just in the disk from scratch. You therefore, it indicates that uh, this methanol we detect must be inherited uh, from, from the envelope stage. So this is sort of like one source showing that there may be some evidence suggesting there's some, some, some inheritance happening. OK, so take a step back to think about closed air source. That's where we actually found the most of detection of complex molecules. And we really want to learn about like, okay, why we see these molecules here? What do I tell us? What's the what's the typical complex chemistry um, in embedded protostar? So I sort of did this, this uh, schematic, like kind of like drawing uh, a, a couple months ago, like just try to think about like how many sources we actually survey. And just by my really rough calculation, I would say probably 160 sources we have surveyed um, that actually. Um, have been looking to like sort of like check their complex ring molecule uh, abundance, and you can see that they're very heterogeneous. Like like say, um, like our sample co covers Perseus, but there's some other sample covers some part of Perseus, and there's some overlapping. Sometimes there's no overlap. Sometimes only a few sources. Um, there's two ORI survey, but they kind of they cover quite a bit of sources, but they also have different design. Um, so. Although we have already have a, quite a few sort uh, sample um, have detection of complex molecule or have been looked for complex molecule emission, um, I think we still not yet have a very statistical sense about uh, what's a common abundance of a complex molecule uh, in, in bed first stars. And so among them, I just want to mention uh, a few things. One is uh, this is so because of this heterogeneous like kind of issue, like the field is so different, like everyone has different spectrum design and stuff like that. So we want to do a more unbiased survey to focus on one region to like, okay, we start from one region, we fully understand them, and then we, we think about what to do next. Um, so this is what we did before uh, to survey uh, 50 Perseus class or class one sources with, with ALMA. Um, here's just plotting the number of common species that we detect in each source. And so we, we found that about 60% of the source has come, and 40% does not. So this is just that the complex organic is quite, quite common. They're, they're not rare at all. Um, although there's still um, quite a bit of sources that is missing this kind of uh, signature, which I'll come back in a couple of slides later. Um, among these sources, we found a very interesting uh, correlation between methanol and methyl cyanide. This is just plotting their abundance. And which is like linear relation. It's like what's going on here, and what really make it quite interesting is that they are not really directly related chemically. Like they're they're not like like a parent uh, or like child species of the same chemical reaction. So then, then we we still not yet quite sure about what's going on. Maybe it's different chemistry that we just don't quite understand yet, or they're kind of being put out in the gas phase, absorbed in the gas phase. 
sort of equally at the same, about the same rate or something, they do have very similar binding energies. So, uh, and also, uh, uh, Shiling did a very nice study, like including a lot of Orion sources and compared to our Perseus sample and the Calypso sample, they, and she also found that this, this linear transfer persists. So this is not just a, a, a region, uh, like, like region specific traits, this, this is across region, across different um, clouds, so we still have this really nice uh, linear uh, relation. And just to compare what's our uh, observed value versus other uh, model prediction, then this is sort of like the latest sort of state of art model that shown in a, in, a, in a blue square here. And you can see that um, the model sort of did reasonably good job in most of the molecule, except for these three over here. However, if we just think about relative um, abundance between these three molecules, for example, they should have very similar abundance we do see them have very similar moments in, in, in the observation. So maybe uh, there's some uh, maybe normalization, maybe that would pick a different denominator or something else to be investigated, but I think generally on a broad term, uh, the model agrees uh, with observation reasonably okay. So I mentioned before, I will come back to this, about 40% source don't have comms, and what's going on here? Like, do, do they just don't have it? don't have the same chemistry, maybe you just don't form those molecules at all. Or they form those molecules, but they still lock on the ice, so we don't, we don't see them. So there will be a distortion driven, meaning you don't have the right uh, thermal structures for them, uh, for them to be uh, being put in the gas phase. And that's what uh, Nazari et al. actually uh, look into uh, this question that they comp compile a two different model. One uh, is with envelope and one with envelope and a disk. So basically you're putting the disk in center, you're gonna block out some emission or radiation from the inside and kind of change the thermal structure uh, in the inner envelope. And they actually found out that um, with the envelope plus disk model, um, at least the parameter, parameter space that it covered uh, for the methanol uh, flux density consisted more consistent with observation. So here, the, 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 so the symbol here are all data, and the, um, the color here are uh, sort of like a solid or like shaded color here are envelope only model, and it's like had to like stripes uh, regions are envelope plus this model. We can see that the envelope plus this model covered more data here, suggesting this is the fact that we don't see, mo see a complex organic molecule emission, maybe it's because they're too cold and they not, don't have enough of them to be put in the gas phase for us to see it. But it could be also uh, chemistry. So uh, we actually uh, I'm part of a, a, a large program that we're trying to look into how to best characterize uh, the chemical signal for these complex molecules. So this is a, a compact, compact survey. Uh, we basically want to do a extensive wideband line survey for 11 uh, nearby stars. Uh, so we're covering about what's that, like about 33 gigahertz range. So this is just a simulated spectrum. Um, that's showing here like what we expect to see. Um, and uh, we're, we're kind of taking a source uh, among like isolated versus cluster or like young versus evolved. So kind of we would ex explore different prime spray, different environmental uh, properties that they're in fact to the chemical signature we see. And we do already have data coming in, so uh, stay tuned. I think we'll, we'll have some sort of early results uh, hopefully in a couple months. Okay. So um, all of that, all of the ALMA observation, uh, emission line, they're all here. They're all around the source. They're all like in the region that is warm up that you have molecule being sublimated. A lot of con for a lot of molecules remain in the eyes uh, in the envelope that we don't see with ALMA. So that's where we need infrared uh, facilities, specifically JWST. Um, so from all of our ALMA studies, all of our um, interferometer single dish, we know that a majority of molecules have calm. This is not rare at all, and but not all of them. So again, going back to the question that I mentioned before, whether it is chemically driven or distortion driven, whether they just don't have any calm form on the ice at all. So, um, so we we can use. Um, so the infrared facility coming really handy to study what's the ice properties 
uh, in, in, in the sort of in the vicinity of the protostar. So basically the idea is that you use your protostar or you use some other bright source in your line of sight as a very common light, and the vibrational mode of ice or like molecular ice um, will absorb part of the infrared light, so you see a uh, absorption feature in the infrared spectrum that will be our signature uh, to identify different ice species. So with James Webb, uh, we finally have a huge jump in sensitivity. We have a 100% jump in, in sensitivity uh, compared to a spitter, which means that one second James Webb time equals to 10,000 seconds of spitter time, which is amazing. And we, we also finally have a comparable re spatial resolution uh, comparable to ALMA. So now we can talk about we're actually resolving, looking at the same region, we actually be able to say, oh, maybe we're looking at like a few tens of AU scale. That's where uh, typically what ALMA study focuses about. And in the cycle one, it's about 300 hours uh, like dedicated, uh, just what time dedicated to this uh, kind of uh, effort. So I think with, with the, with the ice observation, we're characterizing the ice uh, in these um, sort of like perspective, like calm rich or calm poor protostar, we can see about like whether the fact that we don't see this complex molecule in gas phase is a real step from ice. Basically do a test to see, okay, we don't see calm in gas in this source. Do we see calm in ice in this source? If not, that means that they don't really have the same chemical evolution. Um, and also we can use that sort of like ice plus gas um, uh, chemical characterization to benchmark our existing uh, chemical models. Uh, so previously, people already tried to use do that with, with Spitzer. There's a, a, a very large, extensive Spitzer survey uh, looking into uh, sort of like ice features for uh, protostar that's part of a C2P program. But I just want to highlight a few sort of like Spitzer study here uh, to show a little bit about what 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 sort of a like limit our capability is. Um, uh, before James Webb. So um, what we can do before is that we can either use the protostar, that's the, that's the Spitzer survey that I just mentioned, or we can use some background light and just like, okay, let's just look down those background star and take what's the absorption spectrum in the bit, uh, uh, that the intervening gas actually create and we can analyze what's the, what's the ice properties uh, given sort of impact parameters uh, to the, to the protostar. And oftentimes toward the in the region, the extinction is too high to get to. And to kind of stress on my point is that what we observe, like our observed absorption is really your ice-free continuum times your, your optical depth, right? Uh, but your ice-free continuum also is, for example, your background star, <coughs> you also have your dust extinction in, in all the way in the middle. So it will decrease with increasing AD. So higher AD, you get less signal on your continuum. And your optical depth also like, uh, give you more extinction when you have um, when you have higher AD. So this term also decreases AD. So meaning it gets really really tricky really quickly in high highly extinct regions. So previously people picked like uh, protostars as our background light to look into. Like for example, this is the row of uh, core. Um, they are able to see like different. Uh, different stores exhibit different uh, amount of absorption that tell you amount of ice colonies is like, changing. So, and there's only a few regions we can actually do this and rely on. You need to have a cluster of protostars, which is a little bit tricky to interp interpret their physical structure because now you have multiple heating source uh, in your in your you know, in the cloud. And recently, uh, this is very recent, like four weeks ago. Um, James Webb, like this new paper coming out from the Ice Age Early Release Science Program, they demonstrate that uh, James Webb has allowed us to look into a very highly extended uh, background star. They pick two source uh, near the chameleon MMS1 uh, that has AD of 60 and 95. So here's the spectrum that James Webb actually see. Uh, we do see a lot of uh, ice features. This is common water features. Um, uh, this is a shoulder uh, that's Mastodon here, and there's also um, 12 CO, 13 CO, 12 CO, 13 CO, 12 CO2, 13 CO2, all kinds of different ice features you can see. There's also this like dangling oish feature, I won't go into detail about, but that's really neat features, and if they confirm, they'll be 
probably another nature paper. Um, and I also want to highlight how what kind of signal they are reaching. This is this is one microgram. So um, this is just unheard of, I think, uh, in, in in infrared spectroscopy. Um, they interestingly they also found uh, some features sort of like very seemingly absorption feature at around between seven to eight microns that is consistent with some of the functional group complex molecule. So they think this could be tentatively indicates that complex molecule, or at least molecule that have these kind of functional groups already formed, uh, at least to some amount uh, in like in the envelope, not even toward the protostrum. So uh, I want to come back to this this figure that I used for my title slide that so this is chameleon MMS1. So they are picking, I, I don't know which star is around it, but you can also see that this, there's a lot of nebulosity here, meaning there's a lot of other material around here. And all of these stars in the field, they can serve as those background lights uh, that I mentioned. Presumably, someone can point just those at each individual stars, and now we finally have the capability to see it with JLST to, to literally just map out what's the ice distribution um, or, or like projected ice distribution in this entire cloud region. Now we'll get a, a like order of magnitude better understanding about how the ice is formed and involved in, in protostrate core. Okay, so we also have a program uh, that is on Jeff's lab that is also looking to, um, so we're targeting a, a couple of protostrate and specifically looking to the test I mentioned before, like if the, there's no columns in gas space, is it also there's no cons in, in ice space or not. So um, our strategy is we're using uh, mirror MR as observation, so that target a 5 to 28 micron spectrum uh, for a 4 pro star. So we're kind of zooming into like very inner regions, and this is our simulated image, basically. Uh, so we're going to use uh, partially the, the thermal emission, partially the scatter emission as a background light to see um, water feature, CO2, methanol, and potentially some complex organic molecule features. And I want to just highlight again, like this is really a team effort, so um, I'm really fortunate to have all of the, the team sort of backing up this program, and some of them you will see their name showing up in the last few slides, highlighting the analysis that are leading right now. Um, and the, 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 the name was underlined here, they are either a student or a, or a postdoc uh, in, in, on my team. Okay, so, our sample is chosen to sort of like dissecting this, this, this question in two dimensions. One will be luminosity, so we pick uh, these two sources both have very rich complex organic molecule dimension that we see with ALMA, but they, they have one have about one so luminosity, the other has 10, and one will see, okay, what's the effect of the thermal structure to um, the ice phase chemistry, and do we have less Columns or less ice in those higher luminosity source or not, because you're, you're, you're basically your sublimation radius are pushed out. And then um, we can compare to this comfort uh, um, protostar that chosen to have similar uh, uh, similar luminosity and to do the test uh, to see if they do have similar or different um, ice composition. So in July, we got our first observation executed. It was like a day before I moved to Japan. So I was downloading the data at Boston Airport uh, from, from MACE, it was like analyzing data on the fly, uh, which is probably the most exciting day ever. Um, so this is the data we got from uh, a class of pro star, IS-5298, minus 33, uh, And you can see we have this really nice uh, absorption feature, like really nice spectrum. You can, you can barely tell the noise because all of the, so like a thicker line here, especially here, they are all emission lines. Except for here, there's some wiggles that's the baseline uh, fringes. And if we zoom in, so we see a common ice like CO2, uh, methanol, and there's some ammonia here, methane, is, uh, methanol as well, there's CO2, uh, water here. And we also see some, uh, some feature that will be consistent with complex organic molecules. And so now we're in a phase that really try to characterize, really try to model the ice uh, analysis. I can show you some of the preliminary study uh, that we've been working on so far. And one thing I want to highlight is that 
there's some degeneracy, degeneracy here. So the main, the, the first thing you want to do uh, is traditional ice analysis. Is that you want to know where is your ice free continuum, right? Otherwise, how, we wouldn't know how much absorption that ice actually uh, caused. So we need to get this continuum. But then how? Because if you, if you see here, back here. If you see here, there's almost no place that has continuum. Maybe here, maybe. But there's absolutely no constraint. Everything has ice kind of for me. Um, so the main component that we try to decompose will be the thicker feature here. It uh, has an absorption around 10 microns and about 20 microns or 18 microns. And then so there's water features highlighting these orange lines. But they are blended as well. So there's some degeneracy here. So I think the lesson at least we learned from here is that we really need James Webb near spec data to get shorter wavelengths. There's three micron water ice features that is isolated, so it allows us to know how much water is there. So kind of like break down this this blending problem into a more simple just one plus one problem. And here just demonstrating how much improvement we have done so far compared to uh, Spitzer era. And uh, so showing the orange here is a comparison with the spectral shape of the same source with Spitzer. Uh, you can see the, 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 the data is pretty crummy. At least in, in even at six micron, this, this big absorption features and seven to 7.5 microns, this, this really nice wiggle that we see in Spitzer, there's just like maybe, maybe there's something there. So this is really demonstrating how much improvement we've done so far. And this is what I mentioned before. Uh, this is, uh, we have this, this consistent absorption feature showing on the right here is an optical depth spectrum that will be consistent with some of the uh, complex molecules like ethanol or acetaldehyde. But as you can see, there are multiple choices here. So we really need to iron out like, okay, how much contribution from, for example, for, uh, forming acid as a, uh, compared to ethanol. And there will be a lot of modeling involved because we also need to determine continuum, uh, et cetera. Um, but luckily now we have a lot of uh, lab data compared to this is thanks to a lot of effort led by uh, Doran and other people uh, from Biden. Uh, they uh, put out these uh, uh, really nice libraries uh, on their website for us to use. And you can see there's a lot of features that actually increase in like five to maybe 10 microns. So this is really the sweet spot that we can use to detect or at least try to characterize the amount of complex species in ice. Um, other ice features I want to uh, I want to mention uh, one of them is uh, CO2. So this is this iconic uh, double dip uh, uh, feature in CO2, 15 micron CO2 feature is uh, is from pure CO2. And so this will this is uh, kind of people think like to form a, to have pure CO2, you have to go through some sort of a distillation process, basically from a CO2 CO mixture you can distill and you have like uh, increased amount of pure CO2. And so that you start to evolve this double peak feature. And this is demonstrated by um, uh, a, modeling, uh, a modeling study uh, in King 2012 that they look into uh, the effect of episodic creation. Basically, you have luminosity burst, and because that, that kind of, you constantly heating up the source, you kind of have this like annealing or distilling effect that will change your ice composition. And they look into the total CO2 positivity and showing the in the right here is the model that's gone through the episodic accretion. You can see that you have a lot more uh, CO2 ice as compared to just a constant accretion. It kind of like the flat here, and you don't really have this kind of it's like high condensed CO2 phase. So seeing this feature is is, is basically indicates us that there's there's prior outbursts, accretion bursts for this source. At least there's some sort of a sudden heating event uh, that leading to this this sort of like phase change in, in CO2 ice. Um, this is some of our modeling that it, we're working on is led by Jan Kim and Jawan Kim in, in, in Korea. So they are using um, our defined optical depth spectrum and also they are developing this continuous thing technique and then try to iron out like what are the molecules that they can possibly uh, in our data. So you can see that we kind of get somewhat close but we still have a lot of missing slot here and here and a lot of them could be determined uh, is, is related to different mixing because when you're one ice species, for example, uh, methanol is mixed with water, it starts to change how well they can vibrate because they have different bonding and stuff. So 
the mixing ratio, how well they're mixing, mixing with what high species, will always will all change their absorption strengths and also like their peak position. So it gets to a really complicated, massive nonlinear problem really quickly. And also there's something um, we have in our data that we have that we're really working on right now, like try to see if we can look into any spatial variation of ice composition. So I think this is also a powerful uh, this is also a really powerful tool that gems will provide us because we no longer have one spectrum, we actually have 30, no, we actually have 100 spectrum because we have an eye view, we can um, have, we survey like the inner three by three R sector regions. So this is showing, just showing a few different offsets like along the alpha direction of the source, the spectrum of that position. If I just black out this part, you can probably say that, well, this is just a scale like you can move up and down. It looks very similar. But if I just like tune our eyes back here, like you start to see this like this very obvious shape change in, in perhaps a continuum, suggesting that uh, the ice amount is probably different. Like the blue and orange probably have a lot more six micron ice feature compared to the green uh, compared to the green one. So uh, in this particular plot, we already see some variation in ice absorption. So uh, in the near term, we really want to convert that into a a robust map that we can actually look into uh, the, with the ice distribution for different species. We also see a lot of emission lines, and that the, that the wiggles in, in about five to six micron, they are all emission lines. Um, they are mostly coming from uh, warm water vapors and CO, so this is an ongoing analysis led by Kulak and Klaus, and we think this is either coming from the very inner region, uh, maybe the, the tips of alpha cavities, or maybe there's a disk, but these swords have very, very tiny disks, so uh, at this point, we're not entirely sure uh, where they're actually coming from. We actually lack of a resol uh, spectral resolution to do any kinematic study. And um, so beside those water and steel lines, we still see a lot of other like lines as well, like molecular hydrogens, iron-2, neon-2. Uh, they all trace mostly the outflow or things inside the outflow. Um, just to highlight that, so this is uh, some iron two line versus neon two. They all trace this really collimated bipolar jet. I think this is also another really interesting, like aspect or like really powerful tools for James Webb. It's like this jet is not really detectable with any other instrument we have before because the extinction is too high and we don't really have enough resolution before, for example, with Spitzer to see it. And so now we can see there's bipolar jet, there may be some knots here. There, there should be a very inner region is also some sort of like, like another knot maybe. And this is consistent knot because you can see that kind of appear in different lines as well. And so it just identified this jet we never know before. And for molecular hydrogen lines, we see this wide angle outflow cavity that's showing up in, in all, all different, uh, in all of those molecular hydrogen lines. They kind of show different substructure between sources of different lines, but I think they're basically telling a very similar story. We also have parallel imaging, which is, uh, you have, well, Miri has an a IFU, you can also have an imager, they're kind of the same component, you can just use it. And so this is, this is showing the IRF3 image, and you can see this was blocked here, maybe there's some, something here. And our science target, we point our IFU here, this is our parallel imaging. We thought that, well, we'll get some star, it'll be fine. And interestingly, our up, our background position, which is here, this is, this is anyway, this, actually this is by chance, like you only specify uh, the position you're gonna point to, but you don't know what's the orientation of, of your, your instrument. It could be, your image could be here as well. But in this case, we're really lucky that our imagers actually cover part of, a, part of our photo star. So we just get free image or partial image uh, of our protostar, and that's where we see this. This is a combine of these two image fields, and this is our protostar in, in all glory detail. There's a lot of shell here, some scatter lines. There's some galaxy here, so I don't know. I, I, I think when I got this image, I asked around to all of the galaxy people that I know, say, can we just get a red for this sort? Like, nobody knows. Um, so if you're interested in those galaxies in the field, let me know. Um, there's something really peculiar one. I think there's some spiral here. It's really difficult to see in the screen. Um, but it's, it's just a lot of bone and science we can read through here. And for that outflow, we see this like, look like different 
shells. And if we look closely, we would seem to be able to identify that this, there's four shells here. The one and two, and there's a faint one, and there's a terminal one. And compared to the IRAT3 image, this is the block that I showed you before, like two slides ago. The block's position actually move if we think this is coming from the same place, which I think is very likely so. Uh, we actually see a proper motion about only two arcs kind of over 18 year uh, time scale. And if we think about, okay, this, this blob this is moving from the source and kind of in the constant speed, it's very to a very simple back and angle dynamical time uh, calculation, we get about 170 years, which is really, really short. Like, imagine this blob only travel from the source to here by less than 200 years. Um, this is crazy. Like, I'm, I'm, this is very probably a very young source that um, other um, outflow studies also say that this source has a very kind of compact outflow compared to other sources. But I think um, the structure here is, is, is really uh, interesting, and there's all this scatter lines that we're working on right now, trying to try to figure out um, like cavity shapes versus jets and stuff. So this is uh, a study currently led by Yuko Pola in our lab, that she's comparing what we get from our MIRI image versus uh, uh, the ALMA data that she has been working on. So this is H2CO, you start to see these kind of, kind of shell-like structures as well. And this is a compilation of um, our MIRI data plotting on top of the, the, the FOMA high data. So, so for the end, I want to kind of, kind of try to tie all of these together to, to kind of and back to the drawing boards, like, okay, what do we need to do if we want to fully utilize ALMA plus JLFT to have like an ice plus gas analysis to benchmark our chemical understanding? So, these will be a typical three things you will have, and you want to say, okay, I will measure some ice and measure some gas, I will test my chemical model. So, with gas, we have ALMA with VOA, uh, with ice, and just show you we can use infrared spectroscopy, then we use a uh, uh, take the knowledge from the lab, we, we can measure some ice. But um, one shortcut we, 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 we often take, and, and we also do that, is we're assuming our ice or like the foreground material are providing ice absorption only. But in reality, um, in the pro star, your foreground material, which is in the, in the envelope, they're also emitting. You have, you have dust in there that have a temperature. So this is not really a two-slot model. Uh, this is a radio transfer problem that you have to solve. So uh, currently, Jenny Berkner and our team, she's leading the radio transfer modeling effort on uh, try to take a different route to compare our infrared spectrum to ice abundance. And to do so, you also need to know the physical structure, right? And which some part of it can be informed from this gas, uh, gas emission line we see. Physical structure also has all kinds of components that we know um, we all know, and but then your ice abundance also can tell you something about physical structure, like whether you see ice or not, tells you about temperature. Uh, because physical structure can change your gas abundance because that means that you have a molecule sublimated or not. Uh, all of these can also the existence of this or envelope can also change your observed gas abundance as well. You also have outflow coming in. With with you have imaging, I show you imaging. Can is about outflow and jet structure. Jet also will have um, variability. Variability can also affect both ice and gas. So these get really complicated really quickly. Um, so, but all in all, I think this is the this is a very intertwined uh, flow chart that we really try to um, unwrap. Uh, mostly, we're trying to identify what's the best route to go through it, and uh, and hopefully with uh, with the system of both ALMA and gems by data, data, we can do that. So to conclude, I um, um, hope I convince you that this gems really provide a revolutionizing power that like, allows us to investigate the chemical connection all the way from pros to the core to the planet. And our MRS spectrum, uh, MRS spectrum of IRS 3398 shows very ex exquisite details of ice absorption that there's a lot of like inflections or uh, absorption line profile, uh, absorption feature profile that we haven't really uh, be able to grasp about why it looks like that. And we, we already see hints of uh, organic ice in our data. We also see multiple shells in outflow. We see that will be consistent with uh, uh, signature of uh, cloud accretion. Um, 
And I just show it this very intro one flow chart. So it requires a lot of input from physical structure, and that's that's a lot of work we need to do. And uh, I just want to uh, say that combining Alma and really like we finally now have a an opportunity that we can kind of probe all the molecules we want. We can probe the ice, we can probe the gas. We, we have very comparable resolution, and we can look at the sensors and with both uh, uh, facilities. So at the very end, um, I want to highlight some opportunity that awaits in the future. There's just a uh, James Way Cycle 2 call, call proposal was concluded like a week ago, but there's another call happening this fall, so if you miss your chance, uh, you can do it again. And there's also the Alma James Way joint proposal in, uh, in, a, in a Alma call in May. So uh, if you're thinking about James Way observation, uh, I'm happy to answer your questions. So thank you. Questions for Yongwen? So what's the difference between the chemistry driven and the sorting driven? So why are they distinct from each other? So what I mean chemistry driven would be like you just don't have molecule form at the beginning. Like for example, you don't have ethanol form at all. Right? But so in that case we won't see uh, complex molecules in ice because they just don't have viable chemical pathway to form. But if it is disruption driven, meaning they are there, but we don't see it. They are there because they lock in the ice, they are not in the gas phase, so we don't see it with Alma. Um, so if we take an infrared spectrum careful enough, we should be able to pick up some signature for those complex molecules on the ice. That means that it's too cold, for example. Um, so basically, I think what we're trying to figure out is whether our view with Alma is biased or not. Because Alma only see the things being sped out back to the gas phase. But there's this ice phase that we completely miss. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you showed some uh, pitch survey results in some slides, and you showed like 50% photostore objects show Pumps in the end of the yes. the other half. Yeah, yeah. The, so, are there any correlation between these uh, detection and non detection ends? Like, for example, quantum density of end of. I just wonder uh, how this detection affected by sensitivity limit or just photo abundance of them. Yeah, so, yes, good question. So, um, on sensitivity limit, um, I don't think so. So if you look at here, like we don't see like upper limit clustering on certain parts. So I don't think we're sensitively limited. Um, we we look into whether there's a common trace, for example, uh, whether they have different is a bi is there if they are correlated with some evolutionary tracker tracker. So we, here we use uh, both temperatures, and we found the number of molecules you see is is not really correlated. Like the, the the zero con bin is not significantly different than the one you have locked con detected. We also look into volumetric luminosity, which should be a kind of directly related to thermal structure because higher luminosity, you have a higher, larger warm region, potentially have more con to be seen. We also don't find a very significant trend at all. Maybe which is not, our data is not good enough to, to do these kind of correlation study. Um, but at least right now, I couldn't say there's any correlation. So based on this right side figure, do you expect uh, ice abundance is almost like the same between these two distinct samples? I mean, if you mean among among <coughs> among all of Perseus sources, right? If, yeah. Um, that, well, we I don't know because even though we do see. Um, but because we do see they have different complex region molecule emission, right? So something is different, right? If, if I think uh, back to the previous question, if, if there are if there if the source that don't have calm, maybe they are too cold, maybe their 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 disk is too de well developed, they're blocking too much light. So on average, the envelope is colder. Then then yeah, we we'll probably see very similar ice abundance. But if the chemistry, maybe there's some trigger point in, in their chemical evolution that at some point you just dictate 
this yes, no, uh, yes, you have a lot of com form, or no, you just don't have any com complex or any molecule form, then, then this gas yes, phase diversity will, will be a indirect, will, will be an indicator of diversity also should be expected in the I space. Okay. Just to follow up on this, so yeah. you're plotting the number of the constituent species, what about the column density? Um, what would we expect um, this kind of a correlation with the global properties? Yeah, so I don't have a plot here. Um, oh, well, I don't have an exact plot here, uh, but we do plot the, so I think if we just plot a single uh, molecule, I don't think we see a very clear trend. I mean, that's just what I remember, but I can check again. Uh, we, we do find like some ratio of different molecules does have some trend, especially compared to uh, the brightness temperature of the source. So this kind of slightly increased, uh, so um, this ratio of slightly increased with brightness temperature. What makes it make this ratio interesting is that this will be a little bit more complex molecule versus less complex molecule. So if we think this is a good indicator of complexity, which I'm not so sure, but if we say it could be, then maybe there's some trend correlated with brightness temperature, uh, which will be kind of like polymency or total polymency towards source. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's something here, but we're not super certain about Among the COM4 sample, yes. and now your uh, uh, new result indicate possible organics in the ice. So how do you uh, interpret the non-detect of complex organics? Yeah, so if, if that's true, if we really detect, detect complex ice in the source, I think there will, there will be a very direct confirmation saying that the fact we don't see it in gas phase doesn't mean that they are not there, right? The chemistry, the the, com the chemistry reaction that leading to the formation of calm also take place here. So uh, the suggestion would be that the source, the envelope is still too cold. Uh, yeah, maybe it's too, it maybe it's too cold, and uh, I think we know. Well, this is fairly low. Mm -hmm. I don't really know too much. I don't remember on top of my head what the thermal structure looks like, but I know there's a very tiny disk. I think Sue did some work on that uh, a couple of years ago. Um, I think it's a very tiny disk, so, uh, and um, yeah, I, I don't know how well the structure is uh, for it. And so like, it's a very comp very compact outflow cavity, so maybe the cavity is closed in the top, so maybe just like too much material around it or something like that. But at, at least it will really detect complex eyes, and if we also detect complex eyes in other sources that it has a lot of complex molecules, the conrich uh, sources, that will tell us that this chemistry or this type of chemistry exists regardless of the gas phase signal. It is always there, but our interpretation is different because they are not the sublimated. But, but then, then the question is how do we confirm? Because yeah. it's so It is very tricky. So um, I think you see uh, what ICH tried to do, right? So they tried to use uh, functional groups and try to like pinpoint that. I think there may be one way to do that, but um, but I think that they, in this case they are not able to do any kind of quantitative analysis, or maybe they're working on that. I'm not exactly sure. Um, in our case, what we try to do is that okay, we 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 pick a couple of candidates here. For example, in this case, there, there's formic acid here. There's another formic acid features at around 6.1 micron. So if we can use that 6.1 micron. To, to know like, okay, how much formic acid is in there? Then maybe we can take it out and say, okay, how much is this left for, for ethanol to be exist? Is that, is, that, is that significant enough to infer its existence? And, but to get a 6.1 formic acid ice, it also blended with water. So we need to figure out what, so it, yes. So this, it's a step-by-step step thing uh, we want to do. So that's why we kind of want to start with the major ice species, so okay, we, we take out silica, we take out water, okay, then we take out the denominator and then we go to the, the minor species and one step further. Yeah. So like you showed that the mixing of the ice 
definition is very important. Uh, so, so is it is it going to be like the the mixing is going to be like given primarily now by GLBS to like, or will it be like uh, we have to go and do like lab experiments and make those ratios, or are these like are these ratios relatively easily available now? Um. I don't think it's I don't think measurement is very easily available for different for aperture rate mixing. Um, so we are trying some ways to just like you know uh, take say we have a mixing of say three molecules one to one to one and there's not a uh, not a one mixture is like say one to one to two and we're trying to do a hybrid model to get one to one to one point five like. You can try to do some interpolation or something like that. And that's what we can do numerically, you can just play with the observed, sort of majors, uh, lab majors spectrum. Um, but we never know, right? So, um, but I think methodology-wise, I think it's reasonably okay to do that, um, but eventually we'll want to have lab confirmation, uh, especially you have multiple species, species frozen here. And also there's a lot of the stuff that's not fully certain yet, for example, how well structured your ice is. Mm -hmm. um, maybe your ice mantle is very porous, and then, and like, are they coexist, are layered, or that they're well mixed, and they all will change subtlety in your ice feature, which I think we can now have ability to see it. Um, for example, we see there's some, there's some, some kind of twist here, I don't know if you can see it, at least in my eyes, pretty obvious. Um, and there's some, some some feature here, I like can see here, there's some wiggle here. So there's this subtle feature that we now can be able to pick up so, and now that will be, uh, allow us to kind of take one step further to compare to those like small small things in the eyes that we just don't know yet. Can you comment on the data from the reach sources? We don't have yet. yet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, so this is the one source we have. And the other three sources, I yeah, I forgot to mention. Yeah, three sources will be observed in, uh, I think, from March to June. Yeah. Uh, could you go back to uh, the slide where you show the spectra versus uh, Spitzer? Yes. And could you comment a little bit on the calibration, the absolute block calibration? Yeah. So um, we we didn't use the gen flip, uh, we didn't use the Spitzer RS. Uh, spectrum for plus calibration, we use the IRX uh, photometry mm -hmm. for calibration. The reason for that is our spectrum has multiple modules and they look, they're not same. They, you do stripes extraction to get a full IRX spectrum. Mm -hmm. And because of that, you are kind of blind pointing on source. You don't really know where, what part of your stripes in different IRS module is covering your star. So mm -hmm. they, your data, may come from, not from the peak, or from the mm -hmm. peak, you don't know, like you don't have confirmation. So um, we, we, we found that the flux calibrated is just not really, I mean, they are flux calibrated, but whether we're probing the same thing, whether we're probing the same region, we never know. So we, we really come here, uh, try to do here, just compare the shape difference when they're trying to do the, so the fact you see, they look very different in terms of absolute flux. I, I, I think that's mostly because we're not exactly sure what Spitzer data is pointing at. Uh, uh, and then the, 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 the way that Spitzer did the, the spectral, the, the plus calibration for their spectra is also to use the IRF imaging. So you kind of use the same method. I think so, but there's a lot of stitching between yeah. different modules of Spitzer. And, okay. uh, yeah. and, and at some point we just found out, we just realized it's probably not worth too much to, to kind of recalibrate all the Spitzer work. So I think our our photometry calibration is kind of within five to ten percent or something uh, to 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 all our spectrum with like IR3 mm -hmm. filter <laughs> to agree with with the laser and photometry too. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Do we have any last question? And how much info? <laughs> yeah. proposal? Yeah, because you told us about it and what does that mean for Alma JWC? Does that mean you have to have a JWC uh, approved or you 
which time you, which time you are going to, what does that work? Or you don't know the detail? So, so, okay, so for my side, uh, we, 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 right now we have a follow up uh, cyclonite program for Elma, like targeting the same four sources. Um, so, but for, for everyone, um, I think Alma joint proposal has 150 hours for a gem sweat time you can apply to, and you say I need this amount of time in, in, in your Alma proposal. Say you observe eight outflow of X number of sources, and then you say, oh, I want to also take a new cam image of that to check the jet, for example. I think you have to, you can do that, and I don't, um, I can check the detail, but I don't think you need to provide too much technical detail at a, at, a, at a proposal stage, uh, uh, as opposed to uh, a real gem for a proposal, you have to sort out all of the technical detail. Uh, that's what I, what I remember. Um, and the Alma time request should be higher than the gem web time request. Otherwise, you should propose to gem web and have Alma as your joint facilities. Um, so I think that will happen in cycle three as well. You can. You can Basically, you get two chances to get gems of data uh, per year. In this case, it will be free. Uh, you did it two weeks ago. Um, um, and I think cycle three for gems web proposal will be a little bit larger call compared to the one that just passed. I think the one that's just passed has a fewer number of hours available, has more proposal, has higher oversubscription rate. It's, it's a blowback. But, uh, um, but I think maybe that the joint proposal is something worth trying, and uh, and I think people here typically have a really good science case for Alma and uh, for NeoCam imaging, it is really really easy for the source we know. I think we'll at some point we'll hit a problem of uh, a lot of the source we know is too easy for Jeff's web, and then we start to need to find really fancy source to do, because um, like especially for NeoCam it's like super sensitive. Like I always say that like I went to a conference in December. Like, I always told people before that, saying, oh, our data is uh, very deep operation, whatever. Astrogalactic folks spend 10 hours near cam time just pointing in one place and say, this is really deep. I said, okay, we're not there yet. So, um, and for just getting an alpha imaging, it's probably take like, I don't know, 10 minutes. Of gen <laughs> time. So, so it will be really easy to do. So the, you are saying that the bottleneck is on the Alma side, not the FJ data is FJ. Yeah, so it, typical, yes. Typical example of Alma um, will Yeah, so so um, I think for um, well, it depends, right? I think if, if it's a it's a imaging for gem flow, it's probably just do for, and you have Elma size case attached to that. And I think Elma time request will obviously will normally will be larger, so you should apply to Elma. Yeah. Okay. Does that work with your like with the JWC overheads, or is it just the science time? Uh, say again. Like that one fifty hours, which is like the Alma joint Alma JWC, does it also include the JWC overheads, or is it just one? I think it includes overhead, so it's the total charge time. So it's not that much. Yeah. Then it's like maybe it's ten proposal. Yeah. Yeah. It's not that much. Okay. Uh, we can move move the discussion outside and to have snack and coffee. Oh great. And then uh, Yao Lu will will stay here. Uh, he has a guest office at the ninth floor, visitor visitor office. And he will participate in uh, all my workshop, and then he will stay here till 20th. 20th? Yeah, so yeah, uh, sometimes we'll come and go in different times. So if you want to chat, uh, send me an email, email, and we can, we can figure out time. Okay. Thank you. Let's, uh, thanks, guys. <laughs>